So uh, let's begin with prayer and then we will go into today's lesson. Would anyone be willing to open us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Our loving Father, once again, Lord, we thank you so much for this uh, beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for adding one more day in our life. Thank you for bringing us together, Lord, as a team. So, Lord, we are from different parts of uh, the world. But, Lord, we thank you so much that uh, every moment, Lord, we experience your love, your sovereignty in our life, Master. Lord, as uh, your daughter, Lord, is going to speak to us, Lord, teach us, Lord, I pray that you uh, bless her, Master. Let you speak through her, Master. And I ask Holy Spirit, Lord, you bless us, that Lord, give us a heart of teachability. So the Lord, we will not only learn, but Lord, we will to apply it in our lives in the days to come, Lord. We thank you. Praise you, Jesus, when I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So um, how is everyone doing? Week three of classes. All doing well. If you're not able to talk, you can just use a reaction button. Feel free to do that or post in the chat. Everyone's doing well. Doing well. Praise God. Okay. Glad to hear that I finally recovered from my cold, so I'm feeling a lot better also by God's grace. Um, I was just listening to last week's recording and I realized it was very, uh, my uh, congestion was very obvious. So, <laughs> so today hopefully will be a little clearer when I'm talking. Um, so last week we went from first corinthians uh, chapter 1 verses 19 to chapter 3 uh, verses 15 if i remember correctly yeah chapter 3 verses 15 so we'll just do a small overview of what we covered so far and then uh, we'll continue ahead um, does anyone want to share some of the things we covered last week If you would like to cover what we covered even from the first week in the introduction, if that would be helpful, we can do that. Or we'll just do last week's content. Yeah, you definitely can go. Um, so last week, I believe we looked uh, at chapter three as well as some part of uh, chapter two as well as some parts of chapter three. And uh, so we looked at it verse by verse. And in the first part of chapter two, we saw uh, that Paul didn't want people to be attracted to his words, but to the person he was talking about. He also, we also see him talking about his dependence on the Holy Spirit uh, instead of a grand speech or his knowledge. And uh, yeah, so we, I think we talked a lot about how he depended on the Spirit of God. Uh, and it's not by our own wisdom uh, uh, we preach the truth. And Paul just keeps uh, repeating that. And that's what I kind of grabbed from chapter two. Um, Okay, and we. I also liked how you said, uh, not only the receiver needs the Holy Spirit to understand the scriptures, but even the one who speaks also needs to uh, depend on the Holy Spirit so that we can preach it in the right way. And in chapter three, uh, I liked this line so much, and I kept underlining and <laughs> kept doing everything. We can be filled with the Spirit and we can still not walk in the Spirit. Uh, I I got back uh, to my hostel and I was still thinking about it. Okay, that 
makes a lot of sense like sometimes we feel if we are just filled by the spirit it's enough sometimes we just want to feel the holy spirit but i was really touched by that line that we can be filled and still we can uh, we can be not walking in it um and we also saw that in the greek culture it's very common to treat someone as uh, god and okay and we also saw that as ministers of god we are working towards a common goal and each of us were uh, given a specific work and a grace to carry it so if we sowed or if we watered or nothing matters we always come together and we enjoy the uh, harvest together and uh, in the end i believe we saw that no other foundation than jesus himself will lost so yeah thank you jeffina i think it's uh, really great to see not only the like going through what we covered but what you've taken personally uh, something that you've learned that's really important um anything else that anyone else wants to add okay if you uh, if you had something that you wanted to say please feel free to put it in the chat um so before we go into uh, go back into corinthians uh, i was supposed to post a question for our assignment our first assignment i was supposed to post that today so i'll do that on google classroom so please uh, just be on the lookout i'll do that um, i hope to do it by the end of today on google classroom so that will be the first question it's an um, we'll do an essay question and it will be due on august i'll yeah maybe i'll give you all let me just see how the next assignment is okay um is a week okay if i give you all a week yeah okay so i'll give you all a week to complete the assignment um so I'll post it today and y'all can submit it by the end of Monday next week, right? Okay, I'll post all of that information as well, the deadline, due date and all of that on Google Classroom. So please uh, do check your Google Classroom today. Okay, so today we will continue from where we stopped. Um, that's from uh, chapter 3 verse 16 we're in first corinthians um so would somebody be willing to read verses 16 to 23 for us You can, uh, like last week, if you're unable, I mean, if you are able to read, you can just maybe raise your hand. So I know that there are people available. Um, but if you're unable to read for one reason or another, uh, then then Jeffy now or I can read. So if you can just raise your hand so I know that you're available to read, that will help. Okay, I'll just ask Jeffina to read then. Uh, yeah, from chapter 3, 16 to 23. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses uh, 16 uh, to 23. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, 
whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come all our years and you are Christ and Christ is God's. Thank you. So, uh, so Paul goes back to the issue of the division that's in the church. Um, and he's, uh, he's, yeah, he's talking specifically with these differences uh, that they are fighting over. So we see in the beginning of chapter three, he started to talk about that. So he said, um, there's jealousy and quarreling among you. Uh, you're acting worldly, you're acting like children. Um, and so he starts the chapter with this. And now at the end of the chapter, he's going back to that, uh, kind of saying, this kind of division that comes from following a certain leader or getting um, or thinking you're superior to one another uh, all of these things will bring destruction to the church of uh, god the church of jesus christ uh, so verse 16 he's saying uh, specifically you are the temple of god uh, the word here that he's using for temple is uh, not the usual Greek word, which would be here on, uh, he's using nows, which refers to the inner sanctuary, so uh, the most holy place uh, where the Ark of the Covenant would be. And so he's saying, "You're in that place where the where uh, God is um, present in all His holiness, a place where nobody else could go. Only uh, the high priest go once a year." That that's the kind of temple you are. Uh, you carry the holy presence of God. So recognize uh, just how sacred uh, the body of Christ is and uh, the fact that together as a body. So he's talking here specifically about the local church community. He's not talking about us as individuals. Um, so he will talk about that later in uh, first corinthians 6 19 he talks about the individual uh being filled with the spirit and being temple of god but here he's talking about the local community of believers uh, saying you are holy because the presence of god is in you you carry the presence of god so recognize uh, when you are bringing division you are um, violating the presence of god that is amongst us that should be unifying us. Uh, so that is a, like, I don't think we think about this much. Uh, like as a community of believers, uh, we are carrying the holy presence of God that, uh, that we should so value uh, what we have, right? As a church and we should protect it. Um, it shouldn't be something that we take lightly. And so um, he goes on to say in verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. So reiterating that um, together as a body of believers, you, are the, uh, you carry the presence of God. And then uh, a very important statement, if you destroy God's temple, God will destroy you right so if you bring corruption if you are bringing something that is going to uh, in a way desacralize this holy uh, holy uh, community that god has brought into existence uh, then you will be destroyed um, and we're going to see how how they will be destroyed right um so how were they causing that destruction? They were bringing in division. There was envy. Uh, there was strife within the church. There was fighting within the church. OK, and unfortunately, um, or very sadly, uh, this is so common in the church, right? We It's so common to see uh, infighting. It's so common to see division. Um, so this is something that we uh, can really be praying for our churches for, for unity, uh, for people to really love one another and recognize what God has entrusted to us as a body of believers. Uh, 
to uh, be a holy people. Verse, uh, so let me see where that, okay. So uh, in verse 18, it says, do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. So don't think because the world considers you wise that you are wise. So don't go by the opinions of people around you. Uh, if if the world considers you a, as wise, maybe you should go the opposite way, right? Uh, because it's when you become a fool that you will truly be wise in God's eyes. So don't run after the wisdom of this world and don't deceive yourself into thinking you are wise based on the opinions of others. Okay, so true wisdom is uh, God's wisdom. And uh, where does wisdom begin according to scripture? The beginning of wisdom is? Yeah, the fear of the Lord. And so if that's where our wisdom is rooted, uh, then we can we can be confident that our wisdom is true wisdom. Uh, so verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Um, now that uh, statement, he catches the wise in their craftiness, is from Job 5.13. And uh, it is part of a longer passage where uh, Job's friend is counseling him and telling him, why don't you go back to God and lay your case before God? Uh, and God is so great. God is sovereign. Uh, you can go to him with this and uh, you can hope that God will have mercy on you. Right? So uh, this Job 5.13 comes in the midst of what his friend is saying to him. Uh, do you remember what God says about Job's friends at the end of that book? Yeah, so uh, God actually uh, rebukes the friends, right? He says, you didn't, uh, if you look at Job 42, 7, he says, you didn't speak the truth about me like my servant Job. Okay, so here his friend was counseling him and saying to him, uh, God catches the wise in their craftiness. Uh, but actually the friend himself was caught in his own wisdom. So God comes back to him and corrects him. So uh, when when Paul is talking about destroying uh, that wisdom, the wisdom of the world being destroyed, he's saying, don't think that you understand God uh, based on whatever it is. You have to speak the truth about God. That's what God says in uh, Job 42, 7. You didn't speak the truth about me. So how do we know we're speaking the truth about God? It must align to scripture, right? What God has revealed about himself in scripture. Now, Job's friend didn't have uh, all of this revelation that we have of God through uh, the Bible. Uh, and so he was speaking based on his limited knowledge and experience of God. But we have so much and we have very little excuse to not know the truth about God. So when we're speaking, we speak uh, in line with what scripture says about God, and we speak in line with what scripture says or what scripture has revealed about uh, whatever we're speaking about. Uh, verse 20. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. Um, now, the thoughts of the wise are futile are from, is from Psalm 94, 11. Uh, and uh, this uh, may be what... Paul is pointing to about being destroyed also. Uh, he's, because in Psalm 94, 11, it's saying, um, those who are wicked think they can get away with whatever they are doing because God has not yet brought judgment on them. But God is sovereign and his plans will be fulfilled. Uh, he is just and he will act on behalf of his people at the right time. So that is a summary of Psalm 94. 
So in the midst of this somewhere, uh, there are some people who are doing things that are wrong and they are thinking God doesn't see us. We can continue to do the things we are doing because God has not done anything. He's not judged us. He's not disciplined us. Um, but uh, the psalmist says, God disciplines the ones he loves and he is just. He will bring judgment on those who are wicked. Um, so judgment will come on the people who are bringing division into God's church. It, is, uh, it isn't to be taken lightly. When you are when you are destroying uh, a holy uh, gift that God has given to us as a body of believers, um, we can't take lightly uh, bringing division or bringing strife into that body, into those relationships. Uh, verse twenty one: Let no one boast in men, for all things are God. Are ah, yours, sorry. So uh, this is important because uh, when we are boasting in a person, we are deriving a sense of value from them, right? So uh, we talked about this in our earlier classes when they were boasting in Apollos or in Paul, uh, they were basically trying to elevate themselves. They were saying, uh, Paul, like I follow Paul, uh, Paul is greater because of this, this, and this. And because I follow him, I am greater than you, I'm better than you in some way. Um, so when we place our sense of value or our sense of identity in a person, uh, we are missing out on the fact that we all belong to God, right? And our inheritance is from God. So all things are yours. Uh, when it says that he's saying everything is given for your benefit. So uh, he'll go on to explain what he means by all things are yours. Um, sorry, I think I, that was 21. Yeah, verse 22, right? He says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. So all of these things have been given to you for your benefit. Paul, Apollo, Cephas, uh, he'll, he'll talk a little bit more about this in the next chapter. But all of these, all of us are here um, for your sake. So all things are yours. Um, and all things belong to you because you are of Christ. So verse 23, you are of Christ and Christ is of God. So God has given all authority to Christ and in Christ we share in that authority. And so all things belong to us and that is where our boasting should be, in Christ, in uh, what we have received through Christ. It shouldn't be in the things of this world or in our, our leaders uh, or in anything else that is, um, that is human, that is fleshly, that will pass away. That should not be where our identity or sense of worth comes from. And with that, we can move on to chapter four. So we start this chapter with just a, a quick look at the overall messages uh, that Paul covers. Uh, so in the first few verses, he talks about uh, his role as a servant, as a steward of what God has entrusted to him. Uh, in verses 3 to 6, uh, talks about how the servants of God will be judged or honored. Uh, verses 7 to 13 talks about some of the challenges the apostles face as they serve God. And then verses 14 to 21, um, Paul talks about his own heart as a spiritual father uh, to this church. Um, what is his heart for them? So uh, verses 1 to 6, can somebody read or nobody's available? Jeffina, can you read uh, verse 1 and 2? Okay. 
Nikhil. Uh, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Thank you. So uh, I'll, that is the NKJ version. And in the NIV version, it also says, this then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. So he's using two descriptions uh, of him and Apollos and Cephas, uh, that's Peter. He's saying we are servants of Christ. And the word he uses there is hupervetas, and that is a Greek word. Um, and it's different from the other words. So in Romans 1, 1, Paul describes himself as a bond servant of Christ, and he uses the word doulos. Uh, now, a bond servant would be someone who is uh, fully under the authority of their master and uh, who is actually not free, is a slave, right? But in this uh, in this verse, he's using kuperetas, which is talking about a free servant, someone who willingly uh, submits and serves uh, another person. And that word uh, would be used in different contexts. So uh, the people who would work on a ship, so there would be a captain of the ship, and he would be ordering those in the ship to do different things, um, especially with the rowing of the boat, directing the boat where it should go, right? And they would uh, be under the authority of a captain. So that's the uh, the word can be used in that way or can be used uh, for someone who serves under a king uh, or someone who helps out in any kind of work. Uh, now, it's interesting to see that Paul uses that ship kind of language because uh, if we remember where Corinth is, um, there's a lot of trading happening. So there are lots of ships coming into the port and out of the port. So uh, when Paul uses that language, it is familiar to the people and they can understand, oh, this is the function of the under rower, the person who serves under a captain. The captain tells them what they should do and they do it uh, and they follow his direction to take the boat where it needs to go. Uh, so similarly, Paul and uh, all the leaders of the church are given that um, that role to serve under Christ as the captain. So Christ is the captain directing them in how they should be uh, leading the church, in which direction they should be taking the church. Um, and uh, so it's... Uh, that kind of language and also that they're coming to Christ as people who are willingly submitting to Christ. It's not that they are in a place of forced submission, uh, but in a place of willing submission. Um, now, it's interesting. I was just like, if you consider in Romans 1, 1, where he calls himself a born servant, he's talking about his the own posture of his heart, right? Uh, he was fully sold out for Christ. Um, and so in that sense, he was a slave to Christ. Um, but here he's saying, this is how you should look at me. You should look at me as someone who has uh, who is serving under the captainship of Christ. Uh, so you look at me this way. The posture of my own heart is to be a born servant. but when you are looking at me, look at me as someone who is uh, under the authority of Christ, serving under the authority of Christ. Um, and uh, we are stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, uh, steward also would have been familiar language to the people in the church, especially uh, the more elite or the people in a, a higher status, because they would have had stewards in their house. It's like somebody who was in charge of their household um, doing the work of um, just handling everything within the house, handling the finances, uh, all of those things were given over to the steward. Uh, so it was a place of uh, great responsibility. And the main things that were required of the person was that they would be trustworthy and that they would be faithful, right? You don't want to entrust your whole household to somebody who can 
um, who will steal all of it or who will turn their back on you and um, and take away all that you have entrusted to them. So as stewards, they were people who had been given a huge responsibility, uh, especially in um, communicating the things that God had revealed to them, the mysteries of God. Right? So the things that God had revealed to them, uh, the hidden wisdom of God had been entrusted to them, and they were given the responsibility of sharing that with the church and helping the church know God better. So when we view ourselves as ministers, as people who have uh, who have been put in a position to serve God's the Christ body, this is the way we should look at ourselves as people who are uh, where Christ is the captain and we are following his direction, taking his people where he wants them to go um, and where uh, we have been entrusted with something that is of great value uh, and God has put his trust in us. Right? God has chosen to trust us with the task he's given us. That's a huge thing. Um, you, Sometimes I wonder, like, why God? Like, why have you uh, been so good to me? Why have you chosen me to do uh, whatever it is, even with teaching? Right? It's, it's nothing. Uh, it's not based on my abilities. It's not based on my uh, holiness or uh, some standard of spirituality that I've reached. It's based on God's grace um, and His. His divine purposes for each of us. And so that's how we should view the things that God has entrusted to us. Uh, view it as God has, in his grace, trusted us. And uh, and so we are to be responsible and faithful with whatever he has entrusted to us. Uh, there's a, a small paragraph here that has some very, I think, key things for us to remember as ministers of God. So it says, ministers of God are not superheroes and superstars in the kingdom of God. And we should not be perceived or treated in that manner by God's people. Uh, and neither are we to project ourselves or conduct, conduct ourselves as superheroes and superstars in the kingdom of God. We have to conduct ourselves as servants and stewards of Christ. Uh, that is so important uh, in today's culture of influencers and celebrities. Uh, that's so big in the world and is quite uh, like quite common even in the church, right? Uh, to have celebrities, to have um, influencers that people are following. Uh, now, we cannot judge the hearts of any of these people because we don't know um, where they are, whatever they are doing, uh, the heart with which they're doing it. Um, but uh, the important thing is how do you carry yourself? How do you project yourself? And how do you allow people to treat you? If someone is giving you uh, more honor or respect or treating you in a way that um, really is not in line with scripture, then how do you respond to that? How do you correctly uh, tell them Christ is the one to be honored, right? Like Paul is doing here. Um, so we go to verses. We did, yeah, okay. So verses three to five. Can somebody read that, please? But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one praise will come with, come from the Lord. Amen. Yes, thank you. So, 
this is an important thing, right? We don't go by what others say about us. If somebody else, uh, this is similar to what Paul says in the previous chapter, don't deceive yourselves. Uh, don't think you are wise based on what everyone else is saying about you. Uh, so don't judge yourself based on other people's opinions of you. Uh, and don't feel confident in your own um, in your own motives, in your ministry, in your uh, in your standing before God based on what others are saying about you. Just because everyone else uh, thinks you are uh, wow, you're so holy. Wow, you're doing things uh, with such humility. They may see all of those things and they may perceive it based on what they see you doing. Uh, but what Paul says is important is you yourself don't know your own heart fully. God is the only one who can judge it, right? So he says, I know of nothing against myself, yet I'm not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. So the final judge will be the Lord. He knows our hearts and our motives even better than ourselves because we can be deceived sometimes. So our Confidence should never be in our own judgments of ourselves or in what others are saying about us. Uh, we constantly will only go back to God, ask Him to reveal if there are things within our hearts that need to be corrected or set right. Um, and always only fully depend on Him in whatever we are doing. So when we are doing well in ministry we will not judge our ministries or how uh, whether we are right with god based on how our ministry is doing right so we could be uh, doing work that is bearing a lot of fruit uh, we might have churches that are growing we might have uh, people who are coming to the lord through the work that we are doing uh, we may see all of that happening but based on what we are seeing, we shouldn't judge our own standing before God or anyone else's standing. Uh, we cannot say this person uh, this person is actually truly uh, blessed by God or this person is truly serving God because look at the work that he's doing or look at uh, how many people have come to the Lord through him. Because whether all of that work is bearing fruit is the work of God. Uh, the other thing is we don't know the motivations of their heart. And so all of what they do will only be proved uh, to be good, to be right before God when God comes to judge, when Christ comes to judge. Uh, verse 6, now brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. So, uh, so the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written, uh, that is something that... Uh, philosophers used to use uh, as a saying to say uh, when you have a contract uh, you stick to the contract you don't uh, do something that is outside of the contract so Paul is using similar language here um, but he is going back to what has God said about us so he's going back to the truth of their role as servants their role as stewards uh, their work in building Christ Church, right? He talks about each of us does our work. Uh, you are the field, you are the building, and we are just doing the work that God has entrusted to us to build that church or to get the field ready for harvest. Um, and so he talks about their accountability to God, who will be the one who judges. So all of these things is he's going back to the truth of uh, what uh, scripture says, what God says about who we are. And likewise, he's calling the church back to do the same thing. So you speak the truth about who you are and who God has called you to be as his children. Don't go beyond what uh, 
uh, what scripture says do not go beyond what your covenant with god through christ uh, has uh, what god has said about you through this covenant so this is what we will say about ourselves we will not boast in people uh, we will not boast in our leaders uh, we will boast only in christ So let's go on to 713. Anyone want to read that for us? Okay, seven. For who, who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you know, if, if, now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Eight, you are already full. You are already rich. You have re ring, ring as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did ring that we also might ring with you. Nine, for I think that God has displayed us the apostles last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, world, both to the angels and to men. Then we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. 11. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. 12. And we labor, working with our own hands being re revealed we bless being persecuted we endure 13 being defend we entreat we have been met as the uh, field of the world the of course in of all things until now thank you so uh verse seven um, Paul is saying, what makes you different or what makes you superior to anyone else? Uh, what have you done that you did not receive? And if you received it, why are you posting as if you did not? So those verses are very self-explanatory, right? Uh, you are posting in your leaders, uh, but you've received your leaders from God. And if you receive your leaders from God, why are you posting? as if you did something or as if your leaders have done something to get the wisdom they have the leaders have got their wisdom from god you have got your leaders from god so everything is from god there's nothing for us to boast in uh, john 3 27 uh, reminds us of that it says everything we have comes from god so a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven right uh, that's john 3 27 so everything we have is from God. And if that is true, then there is nothing for us to boast in as if we have done something to get it or, uh, or we deserve it in some way or we have earned it because of something we've done. And uh, this is important. Uh, so in this context, Paul is talking about it with regard to the leaders. So they are, they are, they're looking at themselves as superior based on the leader that they are following. Uh, and this is so often seen in our church today as well. Right? Based on our church pastor, uh, we look at ourselves as superior to another church or based on our denomination or based on something about our church, we see ourselves as better than another church. Uh, but there is no room for that kind of pride within the church. Um, we must recognize that all that we have is a gift from God and is the grace of God. Uh, so if we boast, we boast only in Christ. There's no room to boast in um, our leaders, in our own selves, or in our churches. Uh, all of that uh, is not is not of Christ. 
Uh, in verse 8, Paul uh, starts to talk um, sarcastically. So he's saying, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign, so that we might also reign with you. Uh, so um, a lot of the philosophers of that time viewed themselves this way. So there was a lot of pride in uh, philosophers because uh, they felt that they are wiser than the rest of the uh, people, than the lay people. And so they viewed themselves as uh, wealthy in wisdom. They uh, thought of themselves as better people to reign over the people than the actual rulers because of their own sense of virtue, of their own sense of wisdom. Uh, so there was a lot of that among philosophers. And so Paul is using that same kind of thought line uh, to uh, rebuke the church, but he's using it very sarcastically, saying, this is the way you think, right? You already are so great. You're already so wealthy. Uh, I wish I could be, I, I wish this was true of you so that I could share in what you have. Okay. And then he goes um, to the opposite side of the spectrum. I will not boast in the, so he uh, basically is saying from verse 9 to 13, I'm not going to boast like the philosophers do in their own wisdom, in their own virtue. Rather, I'm going to uh, boast in the things that I have suffered for the sake of uh, Christ. And in boasting in those things, uh, what I want to prove is that uh, I truly believe in this message and I truly believe in the that it is worth the sacrifice that I'm making. Um, so we will look at that after the break. Uh, we'll go for a 10 minute break and we'll be back uh, at 10. Indian time, 10 o'clock Indian time. Thank you.